Finance chair is is a very important intellectual public intellectual in Zimbabwe. He's a Zimbabwean, was a PhD from University of Oxford, and I keep teasing him and I call him Professor Zamchia, and he's very modest. I believe he is easily one of our leading intellectuals, not only in Zimbabwe but in the region. He will explain the various facets and implications and ramifications of this document, a, a constitutional provision in the electoral process in Zimbabwe. After him, we'll have Memory Chidabayenzi, a human rights lawyer and an election analysis at Veritas, and an important NGO looking at the electoral process, legal issues in Zimbabwe. Last but not least, we'll have Solomon Bobastibunu, who is a program manager at the Election Resource Center. And to help us moderate the process is uh, Advocate Panzi Plakula, Chairperson of the Information Regulator of South Africa, and more significantly for our purposes, the former chair of the Independent Electoral Commission of South Africa. Panzi uh, has been graced this forum a number of times. We regard her as one of the key experts in the electoral process, not only because of her own standing as, uh, as uh, an expert in elections, she has been an observer in various election processes in Africa and beyond. So I want to invite Pansy as our moderator and you take over from me now, Pansy. Welcome, Pansy. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Ibo, and good afternoon to everyone. I'm greeting you from um, the load shed at uh, South Africa. So if my connectivity um, <clears throat> is not good, please bear with me. I'm happy to be given this opportunity to facilitate this timely uh, webinar. And as I have been introduced, I'm the chairperson of the information regulator in South Africa. And the regulator is responsible for two rights, the right to privacy as it relates to the protection of personal information and the right of access to information. And these rights, both of them are very central to uh, the enjoyment of the right to vote. So um, having said that, um, I, I would like to begin by saying that uh, 
transparency is at the core of the right of access to information. And this means that all stakeholders that are involved in the electoral process must ensure that they perform their duties with utmost transparency. They have to ensure that they make all the information relating to the, elect to the electoral process uh, available. They have to proactively disclose that information so that the electorate can be able to exercise their right to vote. Often uh, we look at uh, the election management body only. Yes, it is important to look at the election management body, but everybody else who is involved in the election also have to proactively disclose the relevant information. And I want to say to um, encourage the people who are participating to look at the guidelines on access to information and in elections that were uh, produced by the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. During my tenure at the uh, commission, uh, I realized that there was a lot of opaqueness in the conduct of elections and that led me to encourage the commission to um, uh, draft and adopt those guidelines. They are quite helpful. Many people think that an election is rigged during the counting process. By the time the votes are counted, the election would have been rigged a long time ago. The rigging starts with the delimitation and the demarcation of election boundaries. And this is the process that unfortunately election of observers do not pay much attention to, maybe because of the technicality of uh, the process. I mean, even the long-term observers, if they are sent to, to a country to observe these processes, unless in the team of election observers, you have people who understand the technical aspects of delimitation of boundaries, um, the, 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 the observation will be a waste of time. I looked at the last policy uh, dialogues that you had where the five principles applicable to limitation of boundaries were discussed. And the conclusion that came from the discussion is that the principles uh, were not adhered to by ZEC during the limitation of boundaries. The question that must be answered by our distinguished speakers is where do we go to from here? Is there anything that can still be done to ensure <laughs> that the principles um, that were discussed in the previous policy dialogue are adhered to, or has the pause bolted, so to Can speak? I go pee? I beg your pardon, there's someone who is speaking. I don't know whether they're speaking to me. If not, please, they, can they mute their mute mic? Mute please, David. Yes, I've removed him. <laughs> the question is whether are there other avenues that can be pursued to hold the ZEC and indeed the parliament accountable now that we're told that the parliament has actually endorsed the uh, demarcation report. Um, the, from the policy uh, discussions, the previous policy dialogues, one of the issues that came up was that the law in Zimbabwe does not address the issue of public consultation and transparency during the delimitation process. I have looked at the constitution of Zimbabwe. I have also looked at the electoral law. I have also looked at the Freedom of Information Act. And maybe we have to look at these pieces of legislation to find some solutions. The constitution of Zimbabwe, for instance, provides that the founding principles in that constitution include the supremacy of the constitution and good governance. And that constitution continues to state that the principle of good governance binds the state and all institutions and agencies of government and at every level. And this uh, good governance principle includes transparency, justice, accountability, and responsiveness. ZEC, B, 
being an institution of, of the state is bound by these principles. Secondly, I've looked at section 62 of the Zimbabwean constitution, which provides for the right of access to information, which includes any information held by the state or any institution or agency of government at every level, insofar as that information is required in the interest of public accountability. To what extent can we use these uh, principles that are contained in the Zimbabwean constitution? In addition to that, we have the Freedom of Information Act of 2020, which can't we use that uh, piece of legislation to access information regarding the um, a delimitation of boundaries process and the compilation of the voters' role. Finally, I have also looked at Section 37A of the Electoral Amendment Act of 2018, which provides for consultations by ZEC when they conduct the delimitation of boundaries process. Has this section been tested in a court of law? Why is the voters' role not made available for inspection despite Sections 21 of the Electoral Amendment Act of 2018, which allows for the inspection of the voters' role and the provision of copies thereof. I'm just, you know, uh, throwing these um, pieces of legislation on the table because I think that we have to find solutions. We cannot just discuss and uh, lament and complain. We have to say where to from here, what action can be taken to ensure that uh, ZEC is held accountable for, the, for it to conduct free and fair elections. So those are my introductory remarks and I will then hand over to Philan, Philian to then our, give, give us the, Philan, I guess, I, I beg your pardon, the keynote address, over to you, Philan. Uh. Uh, thank you, moderator. Uh, good evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Uh, just like the moderator, I'm trying to broadcast uh, from a lot shaded South Africa. Uh, I think these days I've learned to be specific is that uh, there is no electricity at the moment. I was once interviewing a certain politician in Zimbabwe, and I said, I can't continue with the interview because power is gone. Uh, you know, the politician uh, felt so disturbed. He thought I was talking about his political power, but I was talking about electricity. So you can, you can bear with me. It's a bit dark. I hope you have seen me and I'm trying to, to manage. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, thanks, convener. And uh, tonight, I'm basically going to talk about, uh, yeah, the delimitation process and its outcome and uh, possible scenarios. I think as most of you know, but some of the international people who are here might not be conversant with the Zimbabwean okay. situation. Uh, somebody's disrupting me. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, convener. So I'm going to talk about delimitation. For those who are not conversant up, uh, about the situation in Zimbabwe, actually ZEC is a statutory. ZEC is the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, which is a statutory independent board. Uh, it is the one which has the constitutional duty, according to Section 161, uh, to conduct a delimitation of the electoral boundaries into which Zimbabwe is to be divided. And reference is made uh, to constituencies and wards. So tonight I'm going to interrogate the process and the outcome and possible scenarios if time allows. But in order to understand uh, what is going on in Zimbabwe's electoral political arena today, uh, my starting proposition is that uh, delimitation is not just a rational technical exercise that can simply be determined through national populations, constituent size, structure, uh, number of registered voters, coordinates, geographical and topographical features. Rather, it is a hot 
political process, which political actors, hidden and visible, get to be actively involved uh, to strategically try and tilt the delimitation of election boundaries in their favor. Uh, the world over, we might be able to see this. But, but let me say, this is more uh, this is more pronounced in anocratic political regimes where we tend to see a stronger desideratum for manipulating electoral boundaries. And to be more specific, here I'm saying that uh, it's more pronounced in competitive electoral authoritarian regimes, especially those that face strong electoral opposition and for whom election results are relatively uncertain. So these hybrid regimes actually hold processes in preparations for multi-party elections as constitutionally required. But in the process, they also violate the liberal democratic minimum standards in very systematic and profound ways to favor the incumbent or a ruling party. And I say Zimbabwe is a classic a hybrid regime. But within this matrix, to understand what is happening with the delimitation, we should also understand uh, the degree of conflation between the ruling party and the state. I know many Zimbabwe, many students of Zimbabwean politics, myself included, have characterized uh, this regime as a party state and more recently as a militarized party state. So starting from this perspective, uh, let us deal with the first issue. ZEC is mandated by the constitution, yes, to delimit constituencies, but which ZEC, which Zimbabwe Electoral Commission? I think this should be a very straightforward question with a straightforward answer in more democratic- Brand! Carry on, carry on, carry on. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Kovina. So I was saying this should be a straightforward question in more democratic regimes, but not in an anocratic regime like Zimbabwe. It becomes complex because it now appears that the very same delimitation report we are discussing which was tabled in parliament on the 6th of January, 2023, is not an act of ZEC as a body corporate. At most, it may be an act of Priscilla Chigumba, uh, the, the chairperson, and Kiwa, the deputy. Why? This is because, A, it was disowned by seven commissioners out of nine commissioners on 6 December 2022, well before it was delivered to President Munangago on Boxing Day, the 26th of December 2022. Uh, the seven commissioners, they, they clearly argued in a letter to President Munangagwa that this draft delimitation report does not meet minimal standards expect, expected regarding transparency procedures. It was ah, not- Just carry on, just carry, just carry on. We're taking care of the, of, of the problem. Carry on. Thank you. So this, the seven commissioners in the letter to the president, they said that no, this draft delimitation report does not meet minimal standards expected regarding transparency procedures. It does not dispel potential gerrymandering allegations. It is not people-centered and not in any way in an understandable format. <clears throat> so who then uh, uh, designed uh, that, form, that format? And, and recently, uh, we have seen that uh, uh, there is a youth activist and self-proclaimed Unangagwa loyalist, Tondira uh, Ishidawa, a young man who took parliament to court, actually ordering them to verify 
the paternity of this delimitation report. Chidawa actually believes that parliament has failed to fulfill the obligation to protect the constitution and ensure that all state institutions act constitutionally and in the national interest. And this obligation is imposed on parliament by section 119 uh, of the constitution. I think the media has been quiet since last week but this case was actually lodged in the Constitutional Court on Friday the 13th, uh, uh, that's last week. But, but look what happened. Consistent with regimes that exhibit autocratic tendencies, uh, Tonde Raichidawa, the applicant, was taken by the Central Intelligence Organization uh, uh, officers, and he was beaten up thoroughly for two days, before being released with serious injuries. As we speak right now, he's still in pain. But whilst beating him, and these people who were beating him, Chidawa actually knows them. Uh, they were saying that, telling him to withdraw uh, this idea of challenging uh, the delimitation report in the Constitutional Court. Uh, but recently he said he was not going to withdraw and as a result, on the 12th of January, actually signed uh, the, the affidavit. So let me say that PF is authoritarian culture of violently, violently crushing internal dissenters against its hegemonic trajectory is well documented uh, by historians since its formation in 1963, and nothing much has, has changed. But the point we get here is that. If the entire party state did not want the delimitation report to go through, as insinuated uh, by some reports, in order to postpone the elections, then this young man, Chidawa, should not have been beaten up and told to withdraw the case. There is certainly a faction within the state that needs the report to go through. On the other end, there is a civilian faction that needs the report to be thrown away. So we see the party state bond being tested. And in many cases, when this has happened, yeah, the state has always prevailed or the military dimension of it. Of course, uh, with the use of force against perceived enemies, only two commissioners managed to sign the court affidavits out of the seven that had written the letter to Mnangagwa. Uh, one should look at the court, uh, uh, the, the court challenge, it's 550 pages. But the two that signed the court affidavits are Commissioner Catherine Mpofu and Commissioner uh, Shepard uh, Munhiri. And actually there's been a position in the media that no, we cannot take the, the letter that was signed by the seven commissioners on the 6th of December seriously, because it's just circulating on social media. But Commissioner Catherine Mpof actually filed a court affidavit last week on Thursday in the Constitutional Court. And in that court affidavit, Commissioner Zek Commissioner uh, Catherine Mpof was very clear that uh, the document uh, was signed, which was signed by the seven commissioners is a genuine document. And she said that she was one of the members of ZEC who, sen who signed that document on 6 December. And she also confirms that, uh, uh, that, that the draft uh, preliminary report uh, was rejected on or about 6 December, that seven out of nine commissioners actually rejected it. Huh? And that the chairperson said, no, uh, we don't need the majority for us to, to go ahead. So uh, the fact that you only now have two commissioners out of seven actually submitting uh, the court affidavits, uh, shows the degree of the rot, but it also shows how the case is going to be difficult legally to 
to, to, to defend. Huh? And, and the point I want to make here is that neither the chair and the deputy nor the other seven commissioners can be trusted to be in charge of elections, the heartbeat of, of, of our democracy. Actually, if you look at that 6 December letter, the, the commissioners were saying they, they had to renege on their constitutional responsibility to produce a delimitation report. They were admitting to failure, but they still wanted to be allowed to go on and run a general election whilst carrying the nation's confidence. Huh? But perhaps politically, we need to ask why would two commissioners and Chidawa get uh, this confidence? It shows the state of elite discohesion in the party state. Uh, these are not opposition people or perceived opposition people. And I just want to give a hint. If you look at both commissioners who signed the court of David, they have the same history and same networks. Both of them once worked at the parliament of Zimbabwe, serving the Justice Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee. Both of them, they once worked on the Portfolio Committee on Foreign Affairs and the Budget and Finance Committee. They have also served at the National Peace and Reconciliation uh, uh, Commission. But Chidawa's courage was actually boosted by the fact that two senior officials in the Ministry of Justice, a he and a she, I could have mentioned names if it was uh, under Chatham rules. They actually did not want the delimitation report because it directly affect their political aspirations to be members of parliament. Then a narrative was then sponsored that the report constituted a soft coup by Chiwenga meant to remove uh, President Munangagwa from power. Hence, you then see uh, the, the political takers coming in, uh, the power structures that had been created uh, by pre President Mnangagwa. You had the Zimbabwe Youth Action Plan coming in, the so-called councillors for ED, they say councillors for economic development, but ED actually refers to Emerson Dambuzo. The men believe ED and also the MPs thought to be allowed to Mnangagwa blasting the report. But if you look at their narrative, they raise similar issues. Huh? And, and in instances, same diction, to an extent that they were centrally produced. And we have seen these parallel structures created for Mnangagwa now coming to life. I'm told that uh, the vice president was so irritated by the acquisitions. To an extent that Bima, the political commissar of ZANU-PF, had to publicly caution the ED parallel structures. So why would uh, the vice president even come in if this was an independent ZEC report? Only five years after a military coup, a militarized competitive electoral authoritarian regime would obviously not allow the civilians to complete such a strategic national process with potential to supplant the regime without exercising some, voto, some form of veto power. You know, people who have worked as a commissioners, like Professor Felto, would tell you that the real wielders of power are elsewhere, outside the ZEC that we know. So there's a question, how do you cure the military coup before having democratic civilian processes? ZEC is almost moribund at the moment. Its sp spokesperson disowned the report, Jasper Mangwana. So how then does he now even seek to defend the ZEC position or communicate with the nation. Uh, the moderator was talking about the importance of information. And this is six months before a general election. It is a circus, a greatest assault on the integrity of ZEC and the forthcoming elections. But also, ZEC has to be judged according to the process. Huh? You can't have a process without required documents. The census population is envisaged in section 161 subsection 1 and 161 subsection 6f uh, was not there. 
Zimbabwe had this population and housing census in April 2022, but it resulted in a report with preliminary population figures. That preliminary report has not yet been finalized. So Zek actually proceeded with a preliminary census to give a facet of compliance with the constitution. A preliminary census report that was produced three months through a computer assisted personal interview method is bound to change like any preliminary report. And section 161, subsection one, does not envisage a preliminary census. Let me say that uh, I have no strong reservations about ZEC using the adult population only to delimit and not the entire population. Even though I should admit that most countries apportion seats on the basis of population rather than registered voters. But a closer look at the Zimbabwean electoral laws point to adult population. My reservation against ZEC and all the light turn of authorities that slept on duty, including parliament, is that there is no census report. After all, a census report does not only carry statistics, but politics. That is perhaps why we do not have it today. Where was the voters' role for delimitation? ZEC did not provide the electoral voters' role to stakeholders. Huh? And what is surprising is that, let's put ZEC aside, the ad hoc parliamentary report, which is supposed to provide checks and balances on the ZEC delimitation report, yeah? and which has received widespread positive response and was hurriedly passed by both the National Assembly and the Senate does not in any instance mention the voters' role. It is 22 pages, 5,874 words. So the ad hoc committee was not grilled as to why they left out such an important resource for, for delimitation. Some ZANU PF respondents uh, told me that it is the voters' role is an opposition's problem, and that their superiors do have the voters' role. And the CC representative in the ad hoc committee, uh, Sivanta, fought very hard to have the voters' role uh, to be part of the parliamentary report, but he was only one out of 13. And the ZANU PF MPs, who were eight, I think, said they did not want to be seen to be parroting an opposition line. Yet the issue of an electronic voters' role is a national issue and essential to be able to verify the, the delimitation report. Now Zeki is saying it's subjudice hiding behind uh, uh, some you know, legal uh, machinations. Also, ZEC could not provide non-legible maps. If you compare the maps that were provided in 2008 and the current maps, you see that uh, ZEC simply did not want to give a legible max. Well, how then did the process go? I think the first stage was that of the consultation process, as the moderator said. Of course, Section 37A of the Electoral Act requires stakeholder consultations. But my own survey of stakeholders shows that there was no adequate consultation by ZEC. And the process was marred by violence in some parts of the country. For example, on 24 October, there was a consultative meeting at townhouse, which was chaotic and had to be disbanded. Uh, the mayor of Harare, uh, Jacob Mafume, was actually whisk whisked away to safety by the municipal police and and riot police or better still, we can still call, we can call it riot police. Yeah? So, so, so Zek was just briefing, there was no consultation. And I've listened in the past week to residents association in Mashona Land West, East, Manika Land, Ulawayo, and Mashingo. And the narrative is the same, that there was no adequate uh, consultation. And the actual delimitation stage, 
required a formula to be desired. Here, I, I strongly argue that the formula that was used by Zek to delimit constituencies and wards was not only wrong, but unconstitutional. I think a key principle of Zimbabwe's electoral system is that it must be based on the universal adult suffrage and the equality of votes as is stipulated in section 155, subsection 1c. And I think this is in line with the international and regional treaties that state that elections must respect equal suffrage. So this constitutional and international principle was violated. Let me try to explain. According to section 1613 and 4, the boundaries of constituencies and wards must be such that so far as possible, at the time of delimitation, equal numbers of voters are registered in each constituency or ward. And this reinforces the principle of political equality huh? in line with the principles of equal representative democracy. And that is the starting point. However, in an exceptional event, which should not be the starting norm, that this is impossible, a delimitation formula is then provided by section 161 subsection 6 of the constitution that states that no constituents or ward of the local authority concerned may have more than 20% more or fewer registered voters than the other such constituencies or wards. What this effectively means is that every constituency has to be compared with all other constituencies. But in trying to implement section 161 subsection six of the constitution, ZEC in the first instance correctly divided the total number of registered voters at the national level by 210 constituencies, resulting in a national average of 27,640 voters per constituency. However, Zek then wrongly and unconstitutionally calculated a 20% variance from the national average, which resulted in a maximum registered voter threshold of 33,169 and a minimum of 22,112. I argue that this is problematic because the current Zek formula does result in a range of more than 20%, which is not permitted by section 161 subsection six of the constitution. Many examples abound in the ZEC uh, preliminary report, sometimes as high as 40% violence. I think ZEC should have simply calculated the number of voters as 10% above average and 10% below average to give a 20% variance, then the maximum threshold should be, have been 30,404 and minimum 24,876. This gives you a clear variance of less than 20% as allowed by section 161, subsection six of the constitution. International best practice is that the permissible departure from the norm should not be more than 10% and should certainly not exceed 15% except in special circumstances. Huh? See the African Chart on Human Rights, Article 2.3, the Code of Good Practice in Electoral Matters, 1.22. And the principle is also captured in the 1996 United Nations Human Rights Committee General Comment 2.5. Yeah. So contrast to the argument in the public domain that the misinterpretation, misinterpretation was a result of, of uh, trying to apply the old constitution, I posit that Zek preferred this 40% variance for political reasons in order to advance the ruling party's electoral chances. A 20% variation is dictated by the constitution would mean more seats 
in the urban opposition stronghold areas. So the 40% variance actually gives Zek more room to wiggle, to gerrymander. That is why you see rural constituencies have way low numbers, while urban have very high. I think more than 60 constituencies that could be competitive for the opposition were made family uh, uh, ZANU, uh, ZANU PF. Uh, after you know, correctly designing the national average, ZEC went on to give this province by province average using their own discretion. I think this deviates from the starting point of the constitution to see equal number of votes in each constituency. This provincial discretion violated the 20% range and this resulted in overrepresented provinces, namely Mashingo, Blawayo, and Matebeleland South, and also in underrepresented provinces, namely Harare. Uh, by definition, this is malapportionment, whereby you have electoral districts having different ratios of voters to representatives. So if you look at the overrepresented province of Mashingo, the, the provincial threshold is 24,320, which is way below the constitutional minimum threshold of, of 24,876. What is the political consequence of this? The political effect is that Mashingo province with a voter population of 632,320 will one, have the same number of seats, that is 26, a 12.8% proportion of seats to the 210 member National Assembly with Manikaland province, which has more registered voters at about 738,000. Two, Mashingo will even have more number of seats uh, than Mashona Land East, but Mashona Land East has more voter population. And Mashingo will even have more seats than Mashona Land West which is also a uh, more population. So in this malapportioned system, votes of some citizens in Mashingo actually weigh more than the votes of other citizens. You can see the degree of malapportionment in that even Mashona Land West has less seats than Mashona Land East, but uh, more voters. Let me quickly come to Matebele Land South, uh, which is also below the minimum threshold, uh, overrepresented. And all the 12 constituencies allocated to Matebeleland South are below the minimum threshold of 24,876. This compromised the 20% allowable minimum threshold by the constitution. The same applies uh, to Blawayo uh, uh, province. But with specific reference to the southern region. One argument is that the 40% variance used by ZEC is justifiable because it stops the reduction of the number of elected officials from the historically marginalized people who have suffered cruel, callous, and criminal violation of their, of their rights. And ZEC has forcefully argued that the malapportionment was meant to include Matevereland into nation building. Uh, this is not new, the world over and historically. We have seen the overrepresentation of rural districts in many Latin American countries in the 19th and 20th centuries to include them into nation building. Even small states during the US constitutional convention had overrepresentation. However, here is the difference and my point. One, the inclusion cannot be done on the basis of violating the constitution uh, for a greater good, but can be done through legislative changes to cater for the legitimate historical reasons. You know, uh, this approach can give the political regime, which is hybrid in nature, a reason to disregard the constitution in future on the basis of its own self-defined greater good, which might not be as legitimate oh, as the 
Hello, Sorry. Philem, can, can you uh, work towards um, summarizing and concluding? Okay. Because uh, uh, we... I'm going to stop just now. OK. We, so we second, have to. I don't so know what's second, going on. Second, it, it, is, it is not likely that a ZEC arbitrarily engineered representation could have integrative effects in the past, present, and the future. And third, there's no process of national building going on in Zimbabwe, but maybe state consol co consolidation. And, and there's also been media, uh, med social media reports that uh, Matebele and Blawaya could have been wiped off the map. The correct position is that if we followed the constitution, Blawaya could have, Blawaya could have lost two and Matebele and six uh, uh, three. Nevertheless, uh, the cause for a constitutional design with a compatible electoral system uh, should, not be, should not be ignored. Th there's loss of interest actually in, in electoral processes, in opposition politics even so, in the Southern region. If you look in 2000, an average of 78% would vote for the, for the movement for democratic change. But in 2018, only 45% voted for the MDCA, never mind uh, the winning of all 12 seats. And, and Matebeleland can no longer be said to be an opposition stronghold as was or could have been uh, in, in the early 2000s. For the sake of time, let me just say, if you look at Arari province and opposition stronghold, which is heavily underrepresented, if the correct formula could have been used, Arari currently has, it was, was given 30 seats, it could have had 35 seats. But if the minimum threshold had been used, Harare could have easily gotten 38 seats. 38 seats, that's the political uh, consequence. And there was also no formula, consistent formula in the collapsing of constituencies and wards, which points uh, to, to gerrymandering if you look at some of the movements. So coming to an end, uh, there's a point I want to make uh, before I finish, uh, just in two minutes. Uh, so, so what are the electoral uh, consequences vis-a-vis -vis the coming uh, general election? It means that the next parliamentary election is already tilted in favor of the ruling party. This 40% variance produced the following distribution. Urban constituencies, usually opposition strongholds, 57 seats. Perry Eben, 24, which are usually the battlegrounds, and rural, uh, 129. And according to my own calculations so far, the opposition is about 65 safe seats, and we need to target 41 seats to make the majority in parliament. And the ruling party is about 120 safe seats, and we need to target about 20 seats to get to two-thirds majority because of this uh, kind of malapportionment and, and gerrymandering. So the lack of formula to collapse the constituencies does not mean there was no formula. There was a political formula. And that political formula means that in the elections, ZANU-PF is likely to win more seats with smaller margins, whereas the opposition is designed to win fewer seats by larger margins. We have, this, we have seen this in Malaysia with the Barisian National Winning Parliamentary Forum. But what this does not mean, it does not shield President Mnangagwa uh, from the competitive uh, Nelson Chamisa in the presidential race uh, because Zimbabwe remains one single constituency. So lastly, there are four possible scenario, scenarios. One, going forward, a stalemate, where Zek is going to fail to produce a report uh, six months before the next election. And then the country has to resort to the 2008 boundaries. This is most unlikely. Though not illegal, it is illegitimate. You'll be working with illegitimate boundaries. And hybrid regimes elsewhere in the world need some semblance of legitimacy. And, and also the regime is worried this will dignify failure of state institutions and affect the legitimacy of the election, which I think is already affected. So anocratic regimes do not fence that. Two, second scenario, a breakthrough 
where Zek corrects all the constitutional an anomalies before six months and is able to present a more acceptable final report. Unlikely. This is a feature of democratic regimes. Zimbabwe is far from that. At this juncture, especially in its form as a militarized party state. Three, a drag out scenario where elections will be postponed beyond the July August deadline on the pretext of correcting the delimitation report. There is no clear cut constitutional provision for extension of elections. Perhaps one will need to rely on the doctrine of necessity and convince the nation and judges. Nevertheless, hybrid regimes have been penchant for holding elections as and when they are constitutionally due, even though they might not fully suffice as a measure of democracy. Rather, they are more likely to go to court to call for the holding of elections as and when they are constitutionally due. Lastly is the muddling through CISO, where ZEC is going to correct some flaws as a window dressing exercise, coming up with cosmetic reforms to at least satisfy some external and internal actors on the basis of getting legitimacy as hybrid anocratic political regimes do, and then manage to produce a final report. That is not perfect, but it will draw some responses from the opposition and broader stakeholders as a good starting point, a better devil, giving an iota of legitimacy in the process. That is how anocratic and hybrid regimes behave, and I think the most likely. Thank you, moderator. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, uh, Philen. Um, thought provoking indeed. And um, I, before I hand over to the discussions, I just want to put a few issues on the table. Uh, because as I said at the beginning, we have to find solutions to the challenges that have been highlighted. The court case um, that has been instituted by Tonde Rai, um, what is civil society doing to support this process? Um, are there possibilities of an amicus curiae brief being filed to support this? The two out the two commissioners who signed uh, the affidavit supporting the application, obviously uh, decisions were taken by these commissioners regarding the report at a meeting. And there has to be meet, uh, minutes of the meeting uh, available. Is it a possibility to request the minutes of uh, those uh, of the meeting using the Freedom of Information Act? And Philan, you, you just pointed out to a lot of or many unconstitutional processes which were followed during the delimitation process, which I will not repeat. The question is, what, what are we going to do about this? What are the Zimbabweans going to do when the process is almost wholly unconstitutional? We have seen how the Kenyans have used the courts to challenge the election um, results and so on. Are there possibilities in Zimbabwe to start challenging these unconstitutional processes in court? With that, I will then hand over to, to Memory. Uh, maybe she can address some of the issues that I have raised. Memory, um, you have the floor. Thank you very much, um, moderator. Um, to start off with, delimitation is directly linked to political rights. So we cannot look at it in isolation. We can't do that. Whenever we talk about delimitation, we ultimately talk about fairness of an election. So if delimitation processes are not authentic, it affects fairness. And Dr. Zamchia has touched on almost many issues, almost everything that I wanted to say. Because if we don't delimit authentically, it means section two of the constitution is violated, which provides 
for free, fair, and regular elections. It means section 67 of the constitution is violated, which also talks about fairness of elections. It means section three of the electoral act is violated, which talks about fairness of the elections because we cannot look at delimitation in isolation. The ultimate goal is to have credible elections. It will also be in violation of section 155 and it will also be in violation of Article 17 of the African Charter. So the limitation, there's need for us to have the legitimate limitation processes. Um, so far, I am not informed whether civil society has um, done anything on the court case, but as veritas, we usually um, do court monitoring and make recommendations. Um, so so far, that is what we're, that that is what we'll probably do. So far, we haven't done anything, but we usually do court monitoring and then issue um, election watches, um, um, making sure that the public access information on everything that is happening because citizen participation is also important. So, so far that is all that I can say. I hear you, Memo. But, but my point is that it, it cannot be business as usual for civil society under these circumstances. Uh, civil society has to be bold enough to, to challenge processes that are unconstitutional in court instead of just watching and monitoring what the courts are doing. Is there an appetite for this in Zimbabwe? Because you see, if, if we don't move forward, we, we're going to lament and complain, uh, but we have to take action. Action has to be taken. And what action in your view as a legal person, do you think can be taken in, in this regard? Um, in this regard, I think because as Veritas, we have the mandate to monitor and then um, let the public know what is happening. So we will obviously be supporting the court case. We will obviously be supporting um, the constitutional court case. But I think there's a need for us to have like, um, a, sort of like a, a task force committee that discusses these issues and ensures that civil society will ensure that uh, this process has to be done authentically rather than to wait for elections and then challenge the credibility of the elections. It's better to do it now rather than later. That is precisely my point. I mean, um, this process of delimitation that um, according to the uh, the, what uh, the keynote speaker told us is clearly unconstitutional and it has been right from the beginning. And uh, I'm sure civil society has been monitoring the process, the consultation process, you know, uh, the wrong formula or political formula being used and, and so on. And apart from documenting and monitoring, what has, and I'm not talking just about veritas because civil society is broad. Has civil society come together to say, what is it that we can do to make sure that uh, we don't go ahead or Zach does not go ahead with managing an election which is manifestly not free and not fair right from the beginning? Because when I started, I said the unfairness of an election process starts with the delimitation of boundaries. And if you cannot get it right there, by the time you come 
to the counting of votes, as Philan has correctly pointed out, it's too late. The horse will have been, will have bolted and the whole process will be illegitimate and unconstitutional. So I'm just okay, trying to you. push, what I'm trying to push, I'm trying to push for solutions uh, okay. out of this, of, 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 of this webinar. Okay, and, and, and I think, I'm sure my colleague from ERC may comment whether ERC has made any efforts to coordinate stakeholders in this regard. Solomon, can we hear from you and maybe thereafter we can open the floor to other participants because we have to think through practical solutions on how this matter is going to be resolved. Solomon, you have the floor. Uh, 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 thank you very much, convener, and thank you to uh, Sapis and uh, Rao uh, and all the other speakers that were uh, before me. Um, I think one of the uh, uh, problematic issues that we also have to deal with uh, as probably civic society organizations is the issue of how do we coordinate our own voices around this particular issue. So because of these uh, jointed uh, and at times a muted voice from uh, the different organizations uh, would then result uh, in the uh, host actually voting uh, with no one uh, having the capacity uh, to then follow up and uh, make proper recommendations. Um, so it's one of the uh, key issues that we then need to flag and then ensure that uh, we sit around the table and then talk about this issue uh, as institutions. I think over the weekend on Saturday, we had to convene a breakfast meeting uh, for political parties. A few of them attended uh, civic society organizations, not all of them attended. And uh, because um, the process is highly political, people might be afraid of uh, the political implications. It's highly technical. People are looking at their different capacities and it also requires resources and people are looking at their pockets. So these are the factors also we need to then uh, put them into consideration, into consideration as we look at um, what are the key actions that needs to be done between now and the 28th of February uh, when the report is supposed, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the new proposals are supposed to then be signed into law. So those are some of the key issues and I think um, uh, they need to be flagged out and uh, probably a separate engagement or a separate meeting might then need to uh, bring everyone on board and talk about these things. Um, I will probably move to uh, the issues around um, uh, what do we do now? I think uh, what we have already highlighted as ERC from the beginning is that uh, when we're looking at the issues that needed to be addressed prior to this particular process, one of them was the dispute resolution emanating from this particular process. And I think um, going through to the document of 2019, uh, that was produced by ERC around 2019. The key, the key to this is that uh, there is no clear-cut dispute resolution. If anyone is injured by this particular process, apart from going to the constitutional court, to the courts, uh, also uh, approaching the parliament, approaching ZEC itself, there is no clear-cut, there is no one who looks like there is a, they have a particular mandate to end with this particular uh, case. If you go to the constitution, uh, section 161, I think it's 12, it simply says ZEC would have a final say. And when ZEC has a final say, in terms of uh, as far as what is contained when they have a final say, so those are some of the problematic issues that we had actually flagged earlier on. But because uh, again, um, as, uh, as civic society, we were probably not working uh, together or uh, everyone was uh, moving in their own direction, those things actually fell off at the radar. And now we are in this particular situation asking ourselves, uh, is the constitutional court going to make a decision that is going to nullify the boundaries or the constitutional court is going to give Zek the leeway to amend certain things and move with a deformed document and move into an election or is the constitutional court going to suspend entirely uh, the preliminary report and allow Zek to go to the elections with the uh, boundaries that are so unfair uh, that is uh, another constituents with 14,000 and another one with 76,000. So when we look at all these things now we are looking at um, what are the political interests and what are the uh, consequences to the political uh, uh, power holders? Uh, when we look at that now, it is, um, I, I think in the afternoon, the president actually received uh, uh, the report from parliament and uh, uh, he was actually saying tomorrow, 
is moving the report further to SEC. And I think uh, when all these processes are actually happening, uh, as key stakeholders, we are not uh, uh, putting our, our foot on the right pedals. Um, in terms of uh, the key documents, we are challenging uh, we are challenging the access to the voters' role. Since 2021, since 2020, uh, in essence, we have not received officially a copy of the National Voters' Role, despite numerous requests. So we have decided to go to court in, as far as the Voters' Role is concerned. It's a key document that we need uh, for this particular process to go on. We can't just rely on the numbers that we see on Twitter, Isaac, on their um, uh, newspaper placement, as far as the voter registration uh, data is concerned. We need to then analyze this data and then allocate um, uh, this data to the geographic positions of uh, the citizens, the geographic positions of these constituencies. So that's also important as far as transparency, accountability uh, of the electoral commission is concerned, and also being responsive to the stakeholders who are the electoral stakeholders like ourselves, political parties, so many other political parties have requested for the voters for end. Um, the only time that they got access to it was in January uh, 2022. Uh, towards the by-elections. After that time, this voter story has not been provided to anyone. So how then do you conduct an entire delimitation of boundaries without key documentation that is important uh, in that particular process? Stakeholder consultations, again, we see that uh, there was uh, a flip-flopping uh, in terms of that. Key contributions from stakeholders um, were disregarded. There is no explanation as to why Proposals from Blawayo, uh, uh, city of Blawayo, has not been factored in. Uh, Rari municipality has not been factored in. Uh, other road city councils that propose certain increases in terms of their local authority towards. There is no explanation as to why ZEC dropped those things. And um, I think political parties also need to come into play, apart from civic society organizations, because we need pressure from all ends. And um, uh, part of that uh, pressure would require political parties to also uh, air, their, uh, air out their, their concerns and their views. And ZEC must actually address some um, uh, part of these, uh, uh, these issues. Uh, I think uh, on the basis of the time that we have between now and the time permissible to use these uh, proposed boundaries, I think um, there is very lim uh, limited time. And I think uh, part of the considerations uh, that we need to do as a civic as political actors, as media, as citizens, is that do we consider these uh, variations, these violations that we are seeing in this report uh, to be fatalistic um, as opposed to going back to the 2007, 2008 boundaries. So we then need to weigh in and look at if we want a very perfect document, we might need to suspend uh, this preliminary report and then go for the 2007, 2008 boundaries. And if we do that, how fatal are those boundaries to the representation that uh, Dr. Zamchia addressed, to the equality in terms of voting strength, to the power dynamics? All these things need to be actually addressed when we then uh, try to revert back to the old boundaries. And uh, in this regard, our argument is that um, there is um, uh, the limited time, there is an opportunity for the political players, the media, the civic society organizations to sit around the table uh, and then uh, either compromise or talk about the things that need to be dropped and the things that need to be factored in and then move in that particular direction. When we look at the current report as it is fashioned, we look at Mashingo, we look at Matebele in the South, we look at Blawayo. Uh, these are the three main provinces that we're supposed to lose uh, in terms of the uh, number of constituencies. If ZEC did uh, uh, pull something through and maintained their representational level, uh, I think they also need to then factor in those with the highest numbers and then consider their plight as well. And um, just we are losing you so long. Them something to, to benefit because this is where the contention is actually coming. Uh, be, uh, would have been province to get certain constituencies uh, in as far as representation is concerned. We see that these are uh, ballooned numbers in Harare province. They are ballooned numbers. Uh, uh, they are very low and marginal numbers uh, in Mashingo, in Mat South, and in Blawai. And in that regard, there is need for ZEC to then be come out and explain so as to why they had to put unhealthy numbers in certain constituencies and put 
balloons close to the ceiling numbers in certain uh, constituencies like Mount Pleasant, uh, with 52 voters uh, registered after uh, after 31 May 2022. It has already shot its uh, own before we even complete the process itself. We come to the newly uh, demarcated boundaries of Tangam, French, Kanga, the new boundaries for Churu, the new boundaries for Arade South and uh, Unyan. Those are already in the beam. And in that regard, there is need for the ZEC to then come out and explain because communication was also key for the Electoral Commission, but this has not been happening. The, commi the, commi uh, the Commission has not been communicating. The Commission uh, left everything out uh, for, uh, to themselves and then to simply communicate, uh, telling us, giving us instructions. We are not bystanders in this particular process. We are citizens. They administer elections on our behalf, on behalf of every other citizen of Zimbabwe. So they have a duty to then communicate. They have a duty to put out information. They have a duty to explain how they undertook the process. Um, the reason why Dr. Zamchia was also raising issues around the, 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 the formula of the minus plus or minus 20% threshold, it is because it's not explained anyway. We simply see it in the report and we think that uh, that is not the correct procedure. So I think these are some of the submissions that I, will, I might be able to make at this particular uh, point in time. Uh, thank you very much for that. I, I just want to ask whether the Freedom of Information Act of 2020, whether it's being used in, in Zimbabwe or not, uh, because it's also another powerful tool that can be used to access information. I made an example of the minutes of the meeting of ZEC where the delimitation report was, was discussed. Um, and uh, I'm saying this because um, in South Africa, what has happened, and I'm, I'm by no means comparing Zimbabwe and, and South Africa, please get me clear. But what civil society has done here in South Africa is that they have realized that sitting around the table and talking does not yield any result. As a result, we have become a very litigious society because each and every aspect goes to court. Civil society and political parties even take parliament to court if parliament fails to exercise its uh, oversight uh, responsibilities. So I just want to find out whether, because we have to look at a multi-pronged approach. I like the approach that Solomon has put on the table to say all stakeholders have to come and sit around the table and map, up, map out a way forward to say, what is the possible scenario that will be, you know, um, accommodative and not uh, damage the whole um, uh, process, so to speak. And I want to find out from not only the speakers and also maybe go back to Phil and to say, you have put on the table a lot of problems with the whole process from where you are sitting, where does the solution lie between now and July, August, 2023? Phil and can, can, can you address that please? What are you proposing? Can somebody help me? Is Philan still on the line? Is he still connected? Ibo or Tony? Zamchia, Can you check? Zamchia, are you there? Zamchia. Hansi, he seems to have disappeared uh, from what I can see. I can't see him. Uh, can, 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 can Tony come in, please? Okay. No, Phil's I... still there. He's still there. He's just not responding. Okay. Um, Zamchia, please. Zamchia. Zamchia is there. Zamchia. Zamchia. Maybe, maybe he has connectivity issues. Um, Tony, maybe you should come in in the meantime. Thank, thank you. Um, and thank you to all the speakers and to you, Panzi, for laying out the issues. Um, and I think you put front and center right at the beginning the notion of 
the citizens having to take charge of uh, the processes that they're involved in. Now, I'll take, you, take everybody back to the 20th of October last year, when in fact, on this platform, we discussed delimitation. And one of the things that struck us was the appalling low attendance. I think we might have had about 19 people on the platform. And that spoke, in our view, to the lack of understanding about how central delimitation is. Um, people get very exercised by the voters role, by political violence, by the closure of the media space. But the fundamental way, as Finan has pointed out, of how you organize it such that your supporters in particular places are in majorities uh, is very important uh, and critical to address. Now in that uh, webinar, uh, Stefan Danoff, who's somewhat of an international expert in this, laid out some principles that you outlined. And they were very important principles. And by a rough estimate, I would say, the five of them, and just running through them quickly, impartiality, equality, representatives, non-discrimination and transparency. By my estimate that uh, at that particular time, and with the process of delimitation that was in process, uh, there was general agreement that ZEC had failed on every single one of those criteria. <clears throat> and that's what, five months ago, and today, when the report comes out, there's much hue and cry, and it's critical. And what, what strikes me is, is your point about what is the coordinated response for civil sort of society. And, and this is what I think many of us are deeply concerned about, that this is the, the issues of elections are a citizen issue. They're not uh, what ZEC, uh, what Zesson, and ERC and all the election groups are, as opposed to human rights violations, which are the purview of ZLHR and the Human Rights Forum and stuff. It's a siloed approach to a full frontal assault on, on the citizenry in order to win and rig an election. Uh, and I, I saw Dr. Moya was sitting on, on the thing who wrote uh, a very interesting analysis of the 2018 election in which he pointed out the immense effort that goes into ensuring the result, from delimitation to the games around the voters' role to the intimidation which is rising currently through down to actually the manipulating the count and then curing the count by resort to the courts. So we've, we face an enormous problem. And, and my, my view, is, is that what we do with each of these things, we silo them such that delimitation is a problem that one group deals with, human rights violations are something that another group deals with, and, and uh, memory raid the point that, that this needs a coordinated approach. And that's what I see currently, is no coordinated approach. And you raise the issue uh, very centrally about what do we do? Well, this is a big question because it is a big political question. And the big political question is when the audit ahead of time, which has been the basis of this platform, is demonstrating quite clearly that the conditions are not propitious for a bona fide election, what do you do? Do you call foul ahead of time? Do you wait for an illegitimate outcome and then protest? What do you do? And so the question is when do you start to act? Do you start to act on a process that you can already see is deeply flawed in every single way? Uh, and do you accept the inevitability of an election that produces only one kind of result, as Dr. Zanchia has pointed out, or do you act ahead of time? And this is the issue that faces civil society. Do we do the same thing we've done since 2020, no, since 2000? Thank you, Pansy. At least at the moment, there is a court case that before I give this a hand, um, there is Tonda Rai's court case uh, before the Constitutional Court. And maybe one of the issues that have to be looked at is that what is 
is being done to support Tondirai in, in that initiative. Uh, I don't know whose hand is up. Uh, whoever has his or her hand up, you have the floor. Someone raised their hands, but I didn't get the name. Um, I don't know the person who raised the hand, are you still here or anyone else who wants to, because I am quite keen for us to leave this platform with some sort of commitment on this coordination and who is going to lead the coordination of you know, possible causes of action. Put, putting Tondere's case centrally as well, because that's another opportunity that should not be missed, depending on um, his prayer before the court. I mean, I haven't seen the court case uh, papers. I don't know what is it that he is, what remedy is he seeking from the court case? What, what remedy is he seeking for those who have well, seen the court papers? Pansy, while someone is coming to respond to your, I just want to raise a number of issues uh, which I will highlight at the end. Zamchia highlighted the male apportionment, uh, the ethnic slant, a process almost wholly unconstitutional. And memory came in again at limitations so faulty as to ensure that elections are unfair the breach of section two of literature, section seven, section three, section 155, article one, uh, 17 of the African Charter, a whole illegitimate, if not completely unconstitutional process. That's the first. The second point you raised, uh, uh, Pansy, and which Tony responded to, but, in, but uh, or more or less uh, reiterating your point, we have a very weak civil society in Zimbabwe. It's pathetic, actually. And we, are, we're, we seem to be heading for the same pattern where, as you said yourself, we cry foul after the act. And I think the system in Zimbabwe, the state, has become used to that. And, and our, I heard uh, quite reliably that ZEC has decided that, in fact, to go back to the 2007-2008 uh, delimitation will be too ridiculous. And so, to all intents and purposes, they are moving ahead with this report. And it's a mere formality before um, uh, it's signed into law. Um, so that is, a, that is a, the, 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 the crass background, the crass reality before us. We are in a mess. So I don't know if anyone else wants to, wants to come in uh, to respond to your substantive questions. I just thought I'd write, I highlight that uh, uh, while I had, while waiting for others to come in. Let me just find out, you know, many years ago when I used to, you know, uh, work with civil society in Zimbabwe. There used to be Zesson. I don't know if it's still there and whether there's anyone from Zesson who can weigh in on this platform. Is there anyone from Zesson? Yes, yeah, I'm on board. Uh, we are we're still working on our report. That's why we're quiet. And uh, we're very cautious and fearful. Uh, what who's who, who, who's speaking? Who's speaking? Does, I'm Rindai. Uh, OK. What Dr. Professor Mandaza said, that apparently oh, we were aware of the divisions and uh, up to now, in terms of the position, uh, we were very cautious that um, this uh, limitation report is fault. The 2018 one, which was used, was fault. Um, so which is which? Uh, so we're kind of uh, doing a thorough analysis, lest you realize that if we jumped into 
the critical analysis of it before we got enough evidence. It might be used as a, uh, an excuse to revert back to the 2018 uh, delimitation, which is flawed, and the current one is flawed. So the it's a difficult situation. Uh, like what he said, do we uh, lobby or which was which, which 2018 or the current situation? Both of them are very flawed reports and the are flawed delimitation processes in place. So it's a, a confusing state. Our analyst uh, finalizing the report is going to be out on Friday. We were still gathering enough evidence before we go public. But I know it's going to be a bit late. It's not going to change anything. I noted the speaker presented the report to the president today. So it's just going to be open in the public in terms of our analysis. But in terms of the processes, it is very difficult to stop it. Any any more comments, um, questions, contributions? Um, sitting where I am, I sort of get an impression that there is helplessness um, in terms of what what needs to be done. But I think that uh, I'm going to, to try and push people who are participating here, who obviously have an interest in the matter to, to continue to, to sit down together, Zesson, after you have analyzed the delimitation report. I don't know if you are prepared to convince civil society organizations so that together you can sit and decide on the way forward. Because like I say, if there's no way forward, it's going to be business as usual, the elections will come and they'll go produce an outcome that is not acceptable. There'll be violence as it, it, it always happens. And then five years comes and then when it's um, 2028, once again, we begin to talk about these issues because we've been talking about these issues in Zimbabwe for a very long time, I must say. Yes, Pansy, I think you're really doing your best in this regard, but uh, regrettably, the poor response you're getting from us is, is the reflection of what you just described as helplessness. And sadly, this has been the situation. And we, are, we have to say on our part, as uh, Sapis and Rao, uh, that uh, this is precisely why we have had this webinars for the last year and why we've kept the, the flame burning um, and, and why uh, you will, you'll be hearing from us. We plan an international conference which will look at this whole process and ask the question which we have asked very loudly and to which there's no response, what is to be done? Do we go in and have history repeat itself? Uh, we have had important studies. There's a study by Jonathan Moyo, which is up his, uh, books published on, on, uh, on Excel, it is called. It's, it's a classic in terms of summarizing the Zimbabwe's history with elections. It's a sordid history, one might say. And do we stand by and watch his repeating self? And, and what we did, maybe perhaps lamely, as appears to be the case, with you uh, raising the important questions and us very silent on the side. Do we stand by and watch his repeating self? Is it too late for us to sit together, not only as a country, but also the region, perhaps the continent, to consider? What can be done about Zimbabwe situation where elections have become, regrettably, a process by which authoritarian rule is legitimized through elections and heavy investment on the part of the state in those elections, if only to legitimize the illegitimate, in my view. Not to mention what someone said earlier on. How do we cure the coup? We have an, we have an unconstitutional uh, rule in Zimbabwe. Let's say, let's be very clear about that. And people still tend to forget about that. 
not only us in Zimbabwe, but also the region, we have overlooked a very important issue, and that is haunting us now. And this process, this subject of the delimitation helps to highlight the inherent and basic and foundational problem that is Zimbabwe right now. And I don't, I don't think that we can hear anything much from us. Uh, and I would, with respect uh, and in, in deference to your immense impatience, uh, patience in this regard, maybe ask that we close this discussion and leave it where it is, regrettably. No, I'm an eternal optimist, uh, Professor. <laughs> I don't give up easily. Um, I'm told that before we close, we have Jethro, um, who has raised his hand, and Jonathan Moyo. Uh, we, we, we had intended to end at seven o'clock. Uh, can I give you a few minutes each to, and as you, as you weigh in, please try to respond to my question, what, what needs to be done? Where to from here? Jethro, let me start with you. Thank you very much um, uh, there for this platform and this opportunity. Um, and I want to begin where you ended, talking about uh, optimism. I think what is needed here as an intervention is tragic optimism, where we have to be clear about how bad things are in the first place, then surmount and mobilize the necessary political and legal activism to meet that uh, dystopia uh, head on. Uh, I'm glad that uh, Professor Mandaza did allude to a, an available resource where Professor Moyo here produced uh, a telling uh, document uh, actually disclosing important details about how force and fraud are combined to, to rob uh, Zimbabweans of their political uh, choices. And this is starting from as early as one's mind can go back. Uh, we've come to a point where politics in Zimbabwe has become too important to be left to politicians. There is need to do things differently, like what Prof. Mandasa is saying, to mobilize Zimbabweans, uh, sensitize the international community, and fall back on all available political resources and strategies to ensure that the people's vote is defended right from the processes up to the electioneering itself and the outcomes that are before. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Moyo. Is, is Jonathan Thank you, Moyo? Okay. Uh, moderator. Yes, please. Can you hear me? Y yes, I can. Please proceed. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, uh, for, 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 for your time and uh, for a timely and uh, most critical conversation uh, in terms of uh, uh, the current affairs of our country. With your indulgence, uh, partly because you asked uh, one or two important questions that uh, I would like to uh, or around which I would like to proffer some uh, 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 suggestions. I, I propose quickly, I realize there's no time. Uh, I propose to make uh, about uh, six points. And, and within those points, I will answer some of the important issues that I think you, you raised, especially about um, the Tonderai case. Uh, the first thing I would like to say Please proceed. You're muted, Professor. I've become muted. I'm, am I okay now? Sorry, I don't know how that happened. Uh, Kremlins. Uh, yes, you're okay. I, okay, thank you. I, 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 I was suggesting, moderator, that uh, in a conversation like this one, uh, it's important to have a historical background of uh, how Zimbabwe uh, has uh, uh, undertaken this important exercise of delimitation in the past. 
uh, what has gone right about that, what has gone wrong, who we, where we are today. I think in that regard, we must remember uh, for the better part or period of our independence, delimitation was done by an ad hoc committee. And there was a careful regard to ensure that it is composed of people with relevant skills for doing delimitation. And yes, we have had lots of problems about or around that, but we have had it done rather very well from a technical point of view. In this particular case, we, 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 we are hearing people talking a lot of things about politics, but what has really gone fundamentally wrong or what has been critically problematic is that the exercise is wanting on technical grounds. It's, it's technically uh, incompetent. And Parliament makes that observation that if you compare the current draft delimitation report with previous reports, uh, there's a huge gap. Uh, the 2007 exercise was done by a delimitation commission uh, which concentrated on that exercise and that exercise alone. This ZEC is a Bambazonke ZEC. It's doing everything. And it had to do this delimitation exercise uh, without adequate resources. We know that. The allocation was poor. But it was also doing it when there were other equally demanding uh, tasks for ZEC. Uh, the mini general election last year uh, in March, uh, the uh, voter bleeds and so forth. Um, that was a, a, a problematic a background. And we need to take uh, that into account uh, as a background. It's more problematic on the technical issues than in my humble submission, I would say, on political issues. Secondly, um, yeah, as, a, as a was indicated by Dr. Zamchia, there's this issue around the commissioners, whom some of us are beginning to, uh, to label as the rogue com uh, 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 commissioners. With all due respect, they have not helped the situation at all, the technical situation at the very least, putting politics aside. There's nothing they've said. If you look at their 6 December memo, it doesn't raise any important technical issue. It just raises generalities, makes bare claims, but provides no shred of evidence to back up anything problematic about the draft re uh, report. It doesn't even give minutes. For goodness sake, the Kenyan rogue commissioners were better than this. They tried to provide the technical information. They got their mathematics wrong, but they provided some minutes to show that uh, there was a discussion and so forth. Now, when this claim, as they do, that, that there was no agreement, they, there is no evidence of, 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 that, uh, that, uh, of that claim. Uh, so you have uh, uh, people who are in a position to help, uh, but they are, in fact, not helping. That's number one. Number two, they have made the situation that some of us have complained ab about ZEC for a long time worse, namely the in independence of ZEC. In my opinion, it is outrageous for a ZEC commissioner who is aware of section two, uh, uh, 235 to come out in public and claim, uh, or rather come out in public and uh, uh, appeal to the executive and say, hey, come and help us. Uh, we are not agreed. Seven of us think one way, two, the chair and the head deputy think another way. Please, Mr. President, come and be the referee. That is a direct violation of Section 235 of the Constitution. And only a ZEC commissioner who doesn't understand his or her constitutional obligation, let alone the organizational obligation in terms of that section, would write such an outrageous memo to the executive 
asking for assistance when that person ought to know that they should discharge their constitutional obligation and duty within ZEC. And the worst case scenario is a matter that then ends up in the courts of law. Only the courts of law can uh, tell or, or pronounce whether a particular action uh, has been done or not done in terms of the constitution. And for me, uh, for, for those commissioners crying and asking the executive to intervene was, to put it mildly, uh, alarming. And lastly, on that point, uh, and I will return to it just briefly later, the two commissioners who have signed supporting affidavits in Tonde Rai's case are worse. I mean, that is really unbelievable for a commissioner to do. Uh, and again, uh, if you have seen the case, they, they, they have simply made bare claims in the supporting of affidavit. They don't give further particulars. They don't provide new evidence that can guide either civil society or anyone else who's genuinely interested in finding a solution. Then the third point has to do with the Tony Rice case, and I will answer a particular question you raised, moderator, in this regard. The, the, the Tony Rice case is an amazing case in that, uh, and, and before I, 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 point, one, I point out one uh, aspect that is really unbelievable about this case, let us take note that today, the Constitutional Court, through the Chief Justice in his chambers, ruled that this is not an agent matter. The case is not agent. And if you know anything about what that means, to say let it go uh, or proceed in the normal way through uh, the rules of the, or under the rules of the court, it means for the sake of uh, uh, discussion, it could be completed the next year, well after the elections and so forth. Uh, it's really dead in the water because uh, the presumption was that it was going to be uh, uh, dealt with on an urgent basis. That's first observation. Second, the case cites Tonde Rai as the applicant and only parliament as the respondent. Now, you asked moderator, what is it seeking? Uh, the, 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 the order they are praying for has four paragraphs. Uh, I, uh, with your indulgence, the only way to answer that question is to quickly read these four paragraphs. Paragraph one of the order that Tonderai is seeking says that the respondent, namely the Parliament of Zimbabwe, be and is hereby declared to have failed to fulfill its constitutional obligation of protecting the constitution and ensuring the accountability, accountability of state institutions is set out in section 119 as read with section 235 of the Constitution of Zimbabwe by failing to determine whether or not the preliminary delimitation report tabled in parliament on 6 January 2023 by the president of Zimbabwe was an act of the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission as a body corporate required by the constitution or was a report by one or two members of the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission and that's contrary contra to the constitution. That's the first thing they're asking. Secondly, as a Mr. Moyo, unfortunately, we don't have enough time. Uh, we, we have, you know, to close this. Uh, we are supposed to close that seven. Uh, maybe if you can summarize in three well, but, but you, Please, you asked a question, uh, I, and, and I've uh, read uh, it, uh, two and a half paragraphs, and I have two more paragraphs to read and then conclude. And if you are serious in your question about what, you, what should be done, I think you need this information. So paragraph uh, two says, as a consequence arising from paragraph one of this order, that it be and is hereby declared that all the proceedings of the respondent, that is Parliament of Zimbabwe, in respect of the aforesaid preliminary delimitation report and all subsequent processes of the delimitation process under subsection 8, 9, 10, and 11 
of Section 161 of the Constitution are null and void and of no force or effect. Third, that the respondent parliament be and is hereby ordered to fulfill its constitutional obligation of protecting the Constitution and ensuring that accountability of said institutions is set out in Section 119 as read with Section 235 of the Constitution of Zimbabwe by determining whether or not the preliminary report tabled in Parliament on 6 January by the President of Zimbabwe was an act of the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission as a body corporate or of one or two members of uh, the commission. And lastly, that if the respondent, namely parliament, determines that the preliminary de delimitation report tabled in parliament on 6 January 2023 by the president of Zimbabwe was an act of the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission as a body corporate, uh, it be and is hereby ordered that the process of the delimitation process under subsections 8, 9, 10, and 11 of section 161 of the constitution shall be done afresh. So it seeks to have the process done afresh, uh, uh, moderator. What I want to say in conclusion, I would have said more moderator, but the fact of the matter is in terms of what should be done, perhaps more specifically, what should have been done, you will realize that we have a draft delimitation report that was submitted to president, then, then throw him to, to parliament. The public, civil society, and most people who have uh, raised issues about this have treated this report as if it were a final report. They've complained about it, declared it unconstitutional, said all sorts of things when what was required of them is to study the report, outline its deficiencies, and make clear, actionable suggestions for its corrections. So far, the only body that has made a clear statement about the necessary, cor or what they think are the necessary uh, corrections is parliament. Everyone else either has thrown their, their hands in the air, uh, pronounced uh, this as, fi as final or withheld their suggestions as you heard from the, uh, uh, the, the, the official from, uh, from uh, Zessen that they will publish their analysis of a draft report after the fact when the horses have been uh, uh, bolted. And I think that is what is wrong with our society. We do not act in order to deal with what is in front of us. We use a national process to raise all the grievances we have. And meanwhile, the process goes on. As Dr. Mandaza indicated, yes, it is Zek's position that they will look at the uh, analysis from parliament and uh, any other analysis that might come from the executive and <coughs> make whatever corrections are suggested or permissible or possible. From Mr. Moyo, I think I'm going to, to... The, the, the end of the, yes. the report. And what we will get is a final report. There's no doubt that the next election will be run on the basis of new uh, constituency and what, what boundaries. Thank you, uh, moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, really, for putting you under pressure. I have time constraints because I want to give the speakers one minute each. Phil, and are you still here? Uh, your concluding remarks, if you're still here. Um, Melody, are you? Can, can you? Because I don't hear Phil, and I don't know if he's still on the line. Melody, are you on the line? OK, yes. Thank you, moderator. Um, so um, the limitation is crucial and we have seen that it affects the fairness, transparency and credibility of elections. So it has to be done authentically for us to have credible elections and there's need for civil society to have a coordinated approach and not just complain on social media 
about the delimitation process, but to actually do something substantive to ensure that the delimitation process is rectified. Thank you. Thank you very much, Solomon. Is Solomon still on the line? Helen, are you on the line? Hello? Yes, is that Solomon? It's Pilan. It sounds like, like Pilani. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, moderator. Uh, yeah, the network here is, is extremely bad. I uh, hope you can hear me. So, I I hear I had to hear uh, bits and part, uh, but I just want to say that uh, uh, there's no need uh, for us to uh, treat this uh, exercise as an isolated event of the broader uh, political electoral process in in Zimbabwe, and uh, a critical question is that uh, is the current ZEC with all the problematics that we have seen in a position to deliver a relatively, relatively free, fair and democratic uh, election in the next six months. Uh, in my humble view, I do not think that uh, it, is, it is possible. I will not repeat some of the uh, submissions uh, that I have made uh, that uh, Professor Moyo has also has also noted about Zeki's status at the moment. Uh, I, I think uh, if we're going to just think that this problem will be resolved, the Zimbabwean question will be resolved in a technicist manner, then what you would want to see uh, is that uh, civil society uh, to come up uh, with some kind of broader alliance because they seem to be agreeing. But I don't see that happening uh, in the next month or so, precisely because of the context also. That's why I said it will not be fair to just analyze this as a technicist uh, process without including the broader politics at play. Because some of the members of civil society organizations, uh, uh, that I've been interacting with, they are very clear that they are also scared about the private voluntary organizations bill, uh, which in many ways threatens the existence of some of the radical and and some of the radical CSOs that are critical of the regime. That's the political reality today. So at the end of this might not be whether one supports maybe a Tony Rice case. I think I tried to uh, give an indication that Tondera Chidawa is not seen perhaps as an independent citizen as it would be if we had an organization like ERC or Zesni or Veritas uh, going to court because they have legitimacy. This is uh, purely an issue of the internal contradictions within the ruling party, which is conflated uh, with the state. So you would see that um, uh, progressive citizens, civil society might not want to be seen to be involved in the internal contradictions within ZANU PF. I think they also learned what they did in terms of giving some level of support uh, to the military coup that deposed former President Mugabe in 2017. So the Tundere Dawa is not seen as a legitimate platform where we would expect civil society to jump in because they might be swallowed uh, by the ZANU PF uh, politics. Having said that, I think going going forward, we should the Zimbabweans should not just narrow down uh, on what the political parties want, because the main political parties, unfortunately, they both think that they're going to win the election on the basis of this draft delim uh, delimitation report when if we finalized with the minimum changes. Uh, they both think they are going to win and uh, uh, that becomes a problematic because it's on the basis of political expedience, not on the basis of upholding the tenets of representative democracy and constitutionalism. Uh, 
So going back to my scenarios, uh, lastly, I think we need to think more broadly to say, is Zek able to hold a relatively credible election in the next six months when they are constitutional due? Um, I'm afraid my answer is no. And if my answer is no, uh, what then do you do? Uh, I think what you need to do is to look at the two uh, possible scenarios that I, I offered. There was one on a breakthrough scenario where you're gonna, and another one on a drag through scenario. Uh, so possibly uh, not to be boxed in the way that a hybrid regime would think that let's just have an election for the sake of fulfilling a certain clause, even though they are not democratic. You might need to start thinking outside the box to say, how do you collapse uh, the, the drag through and the breakthrough together? but with some kind of proper regional oversight. I think as, as, as we have witnessed moderator, civil society is actually in a fix because also partly internal weaknesses, but partly because of the autocratic tendencies of the political regime in Zimbabwe. So you need some kind as well of, of guarantors uh, to the process to say, how can you have a drag through that, that leads uh, to a democratic breakthrough. And that might not even require a technicist approach to say, let's just have elections in the next few months. I wouldn't mind uh, postponing maybe elections for two or three months if there's a credible guarantor regionally, internationally, to ensure that ZEC does the right thing. There is no way anybody, anyway, even from Mars, can sanitize uh, what ZEC has done. It's a constitutional nullity. I tell you, even the final report that will come, I hear that is preliminary. The process already is totally flawed. It's a constitutional knowledge. How then do you have a constitutionally legitimate election out of a constitutional knowledge? Never mind about political and social legitimacy of the whole process. How do you start from a disputed election? So William, team, can you round up, please? Uh, think, I have to leave. I have out. another meeting, actually. So um, let's think out of the box to drag through for a democratic breakthrough. Thank you. Uh, let me conclude by saying what gives me hope um, out of this process is the international conference that Ibo referred to. And I'm hoping that uh, that international conference, which will include regional players, to just assess uh, what feeling you everyone has spoken about you, to say is is Zach capable of running a free and fair election taking into consideration everything that has been said i'm hoping that that uh, conference will 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 proceed and that uh, the it will have regional representatives to look at this issue before the elections i think this is where we're going to end and thank you very much to all the speakers, all the participants. Uh, thank you, the convener, for inviting me. And I can only wish you strength and all the best as we prepare for the July, August 2023 election. Thank you very much. The Penzi. meeting is urgent. Yes. Thank you, Mayor Penzi. Thank you very much. My role is just to thank you and the panelists, but especially yourself, for the manner in which you have conducted this, this session and the kind of conclusions, the kind of interrogation that you have made, we thank you sincerely. We'll be in touch, especially about the international conference. Thank you very much. And to thank the next you, time. And, and goodbye to everyone, and good night. Night, night everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes, bye. Thank you, bye. Kaina komi moto, ona pango.